let's go ahead and get the ball rolling. Uh, Jason, could you give us a little bit about your background and your publishing journey and then how you got into and started learning about AI? Well, first of all, thank you everybody for being here. It's a real pleasure to see all of you. Uh, my name is Jason Hamilton, and I got into the self-publishing space back in 2017, started publishing my first few books, um, did that for a number of years. Then in 2020, 2021, somewhere in there, I started working for Kindlepreneur as their lead content specialist. And if you're not unfamiliar with Kindlepreneur, it's a really great uh, resource for authors who want to get into self-publishing. Uh, and it's also from the same people that br brought you Publisher Rocket and Atticus, and uh, they have other stuff that they're working on. Uh, and I worked there for about three years. And then um, uh, while I was working for Kindlepreneur, AI started to become much more of a thing. And I got really interested in it. And part of that was professional, like working in Kindlepreneur, you have to sort of be on top of these things, all of these developments. Uh, but as I got into it, I realized uh, just the the potential that it had. And I started creating a YouTube channel that's called The Nerdy Novelist uh, with some practical advice on how to use it. Because I saw tons, and I mean tons, of videos by self-appointed gurus, uh, most of which were under 30, on uh, on YouTube telling you how to write a novel with AI and having used AI in various capacities uh, to try and get something usable out of it that I could actually uh, be proud of and use in a novel, I knew that pretty much like 99% of what they were talking about was just utter bull, right? Um, and so I created my first video, like an hour long tutorial video about how to write a book with ChatGPT. And, um, it started to gain a little traction. So I made a few other videos and it just sort of spiraled out of control, not out of control, but it started, it, <laughs> uh, it got, uh, it, it started to gain some steam. Uh, and so that's actually why I left my job at Kindlepreneurs to go full-time on that YouTube channel, which is what I do to this day. So it's all about AI and all of the different ways to use it. And there's so many different ways to use it. There's no one way. Um, I know there's lots of, a lot of, controversy and criticism behind AI, but there's just so many different ways in which it can be useful. And you don't have to use AI to write your book or, or what, you know, anything that you find distasteful, you don't have to use it in those ways um, because this is all about augmenting where you are at in the things that you maybe aren't as good at and, and don't like as much, uh, giving you more time and uh, more creativity to save for the things that you do like. So going back to you were saying there are, you know, hesitancies around using AI for certain things and you don't have to use AI for parts that you don't want to use it for and all that stuff. What are some common misconceptions that authors might have about using AI in that book writing process? Because like you were saying, you can't just use AI to write a full book. That it's not going to work like yeah. that. So what are some, what are some, just like some other common misconceptions around AI? Yeah, well, I think you just hit the big one right there. It's that um, a lot of people think that it's push a button and out pops a, a book, right? And it just isn't that at all. Um, I, and in fact, I really wish people could fully understand just how much, like, even if I am using AI for the text generation of my chapters, I wish people could really understand just how much it still feels like me. Uh, like it's like it's coming from me. It's my story. Um, now, of course, you're going to get some bad actors that do try to create a whole bunch of, uh, you know, not really great books. I'm not too worried about them, to be honest, because um, that was the same concern that came up in the beginning of the self-publishing movement is that we, the, the Amazon would be flooded with a tsunami of crap. And um, the solution to that is very simple. You just don't write crap. And the same is true in the AI age. AI is capable of doing a lot of things, but at least for now, if you're not guiding it very carefully along the process and carefully acting as uh, like the chief creative director 
basically behind the whole thing uh it's it's going to be crap uh, and um and we don't want to write crap and so uh the people that are using ai well you would never know that they used ai um they're they're using it inside of their process in such a way and they're guiding it so carefully that it's theirs and from my perspective like i re i really wish i could get this across to some some of the haters out there just because like if you really did it the way like i teach you to do it um it would not feel any less like your creative vision uh and people like well i won't get into that but like um if i'm using it to write a chapter of a book i still have to tell it everything that happens in that chapter I have to tell it what the characters are, who they are and what they're like and what they talk like. Um, often I will give it examples of my writing so that it knows how to write like me. Um, I have to give it um, uh, like information about the world building and the outline. And there's like tons of tons of stuff that I have to create and put in there to get so it'll know. And then it needs to write it out. And usually that requires a fair amount of editing to get it up to my standards. And by the end, I've got a complete chapter that yes, technically AI assisted in the writing of, but really, even though the process is different on how I got there, it feels no less like my thing than if I had written it myself. And the main difference, I think, is just the process of getting there. Um, uh, as well as I would also say the mental uh, load that it takes off of you. Because every sentence you write, you're making like a, a dozen micro decisions uh, about what should happen. You know, how, should she react this way? Should he say it in quite that way? Uh, like what should her thoughts be after he said that? And like, you're making all of these decisions and second guessing half of them and um, writing it all down. AI kind of like removes a lot of that mental drain so that instead of having to make all those decisions as you go and draining your creative well, it writes it all for you. And then you just have to like say yes, no, no, yes. And figure out, uh, you know, what works and what doesn't. It's much easier to edit the text that AI gives you and make it your own than it is to just like come up with it out of whole cloth, if that makes sense. There are writing tools out there where when you're writing, uh, the stuff that you've just written disappears as you write new sentences so that you can't look back at what you've just written because there is that tendency for a lot of people to start editing what they've just written instead of focusing on what they're writing next. And it is that buildup of constantly second guessing yourself about all the decisions that you've just made and what you've yeah. just written instead of focusing on like the path forward. So that can certainly be a struggle for a lot of authors. And I can see how AI would take a lot of that off your plate. And then you can just focus on the really taking taking the story and the plot that you you wanted to build and then turning those words into something that are yours. You talked a little bit about how your process works just kind of briefly there, but I'd really love an overview of how have you incorporated AI just into the process as a whole from the brainstorming to the plotting, to the writing, to the editing stage. I'm sure there are parts at every stage where you have incorporated AI into that process a, a little bit, and I'm sure it's going to vary a little bit. Um, so <laughs> I'm sure that would be like a very long answer to cover all of those things. So maybe let's just start at the brainstorming outlining stage. Are you using AI for that part and how so? Yeah. Um, so for, first of all, let me clarify or caveat this the fact that every author is different and um and and they incorporate ai in very different ways but i will say though because i'm kind of deep into this for my channel and everything <laughs> there's like hardly any part of my process that hasn't been affected at least somewhat by ai at this point 
it is so integrated into every single part of my process that it's really hard to know where it be where it ends and I begin. Um, but uh, for brainstorming and outlining, that's actually the part where it is probably involved the least. Because um, I'm I'm a storyteller. I identify more as a storyteller than as a writer. Uh, when I was young, I wanted to be a film director. Uh, and then I got into writing. But those are all just mechanisms of getting the story out of my brain and into something tangible that people can experience. Um, and so my favorite part of the entire storytelling process is that initial brainstorming and outlining process, the coming up with of the ideas and figuring out what the story is going to be. And usually I have very clear ideas in my head or like once I sit down and start to write it out, the ideas start flowing and I get into that creative flow. And it's just, uh, for me, it's a wonderful experience. And, uh, at least in my experience, I haven't gotten AI to be able to outline as well as I can outline, uh, or even to get me uh, a good like 50% of the way there. Now it can do a decent job. And I'm sure there are other people that are better at it than I am because um, just the fact that I don't use it as much means I haven't spent a lot of time prompting and trying to figure it out. But um, um, the way it works is I usually start the writing and the brainstorming myself. I'll just, you know, brain dump everything onto a blank piece of paper and uh, start figuring it out and start writing out, you know, chapter one, write a paragraph, chapter two, write a paragraph. Um, and then if I get stuck, if I get to a point where I'm just like, eh, I'm not really sure what should happen here. Then I go to the AI say, here's what I've done so far. Here are like one or two ideas that I have, or here's where it needs to go. Here's where it ends or whatever. Uh, and then I'll ask it to give me like five to 10 ideas for what could happen in the next chapter or five to 10 ideas for whatever it is I'm stuck with. Um, and then it'll give me a bunch of stuff. And even if I don't like any of the ideas that it gives me, typically even seeing a bad idea is enough to start, spark your pre creativity to then say, okay, actually, I know which way this is supposed to go. And it usually gets me unstuck. Um, even if even if I don't use any of the ideas, just going and asking and seeing some responses is enough to get me unstuck. Weirdly, it's like a weird way that the brain works. Um, and so from there, uh, well, ba basically my point with all that is like, I genuinely believe this at this point, if you're using AI effectively, there's no excuse for writer's block anymore. Like I genuinely believe that. I have never gotten stuck, prop like really stuck since I started using AI. Was writer's block something that you dealt with frequently before? Not too often, but um, burnout was. Uh, I went through a long period, uh, a couple of years even where I was totally burned out and was not able to write hardly at all. And uh, that's actually one of the reasons that AI interested me so much in the beginning when I was first looking into it, because um, I realized that it really lowered that resistance for me to get started. Because I would sit down and get ready to write on the page, and like my, I would just freeze up, right? And that doesn't happen anymore. I definitely understand that perspective of just getting, even getting like a bad idea helps you helps catalyze you to come up with <laughs> something that is your own idea. Um, it just gets those like synapses in your brain firing. Uh, I know mm -hmm. like, <laughs> I know uh, my wife will also frequently be like, hey, Evan, what do you think would be better? This thing or this thing? And I'm like, uh, I think that thing sounds better. And she's like, no, you're wrong. Actually, this other thing is better. <laughs> and now like that you told me that that thing was good. Now I realize actually <laughs> that, that's what <laughs> hearing your opinion made me uh, made me pick, like made my brain pick yeah. or whatever. So just like even <laughs> getting someone else's opinion uh, makes, uh, it makes that difference sometimes. So <clears throat> that's for the brainstorming and sort of outlining process. What about when it comes to then taking that outline or or group of ideas and turning it into an actual book? What is what is your process like when you're sitting down to write a chapter? And we also got a question about what tools or platforms you're using when mm -hmm. you're doing these things as well. This is a, this is a good point to answer both of those questions, actually, because 
your process will depend a lot on which tools you're using. Um, first of all, I'll say this is one of those areas where uh, people differ a lot. Um, a lot of people who use AI even heavily won't use it for writing the first draft because that's just the part that brings them the most joy uh, or what have you. Uh, it's just It's one of those things that depends on the per person. I'll tell you that for me personally, like I said, I feel uh, I identify more as a storyteller than as a writer. I don't care if the stories come out as books or as movies or as video games. Like I'm just happy to create stories, right? Um, and so some people are surprised by the fact when I tell them that I don't really enjoy the writing process, like the actual first draft writing. Um, and so that's, so I do, me personally, I do use AI to help me with the first draft uh, of each chapter. And I kind of explained it already a little bit how I'll, I'll, I'll give it instructions on what should happen in the scene. It writes it, then I edit it to make sure it's consistent and uh, and the style's good and and uh, of a quality that I'm happy with. And that's generally the the way people go about this. They take kind of like a start small, get bigger approach. Um, I call it the fractal technique, where you start with like your initial idea, then you work that into an outline, then you work each chapter of an outline into a more detailed scene outline, or you can call it story beats or just a list of instructions for that scene. And then you take those instructions and you give it to an AI to actually write the entire scene out. And there's more to it too. Like you can add information about your characters so that they don't all sound like the same person talking, right? Like each person sounds unique, has a different voice. Um, you can give it information about your world building. You can give it information about the style in which you want it to write. Um, I think one person asked a question earlier about the, how to get the large language model to write in your own voice and style. It's difficult, but like one option is to include an example of your own writing. Some of the models, particularly uh, Claude 3.5 Sonnet and the most recent release of GPT-01, are very good at uh, listening to instructions to, to look at a sample chapter and then write in your style. Uh, not all models are, but those two in particular seem to be pretty good at it. Uh, and then you basically assemble all of that information into a giant super prompt, um, feed it into an AI, and it can spit out a scene. Uh, now, I'm making it sound really easy. It's not necessarily always that easy. Um, it won't necessarily spit out the scene all at once. You might have to do it in like 400 word chunks or so. Uh, it depends a little bit on your style and the prompts that you use and uh, just how you want to go about it. Um, there are a bunch of tools out there. Uh, the uh, well, for, okay. hmm. uh, let let me just re the, 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 it's kind of complicated, so sometimes it's, it's hard to break <laughs> down. Let let me quickly make it uh, make a distinction between the AI models and the tools that I use. So an AI model. Uh, is the actual large language model that is generating the text. And there are hundreds of these at this point. The most well-known ones are the ones that are coming from ChatGPT, uh, but even ChatGPT is using multiple models inside of it um, and they upgrade over time. When ChatGPT first launched, it launched with a model called GPT 3.5. A few months later, we got GPT 4. These days, the most common ones used in ChatGPT are GPT-4.0 um, and GPT-01. <laughs> Again, I know this is all like really complicated. So there's like multiple models and they get progressively better usually over time as they train new ones and, and all of this. And some are also better at some tasks than others. Uh, like O1 is really good at math and reasoning. So that might not sound too relevant to an, a creative writer, but uh, we're actually finding it's brand new. So we're still working with it. Uh, we're actually finding it's better than any other model before it at editing text. Um, but it's also really expensive to use. Um, I throw one prompt in it and it can cost me 50 to like 80 cents. Um, and that's just for one prompt. And so like if, if I'm writing a whole book or editing a whole book, I'm going to be uh, doing a, like at least a hundred or more prompts. And so that's, that's going to cost me, you know, 30, but 30 to 50 or more 
dollars to just get edit a whole book. So there, there's all these like pros and cons and things you have to keep in mind. Um, my favorite models come from Claude. Or, or the company's called Anthropic. They create the Claude models. And there's a bunch of those too. So the most recent, most advanced one is Claude 3.5 Sonnet. Um, and that's my current favorite model, uh, just as an overall model. Uh, and there are also models out there that specialize in or or can be used for other things. They're, they might be, for instance, less um, less moderated. So you could do not safe for work content there if you write that kind of, those kind of genres. Um, because the GPT and the Claude models won't let you do that. Um, and so there's like all of these gives and takes. The tools, on the other hand, take these models and utilize them in different ways. Um, the most common one that everyone knows is ChatGPT, uh, and that one is exclusive to OpenAI and their models. So it, you'll only find OpenAI's models in there, the GPT-4, 4.0, 01, all of those are all inside. Uh, but then you will also find some that are more geared for authors that access a lot more models, uh, not just the GPT models. So the two that are probably most well-known at this point in the author community are Pseudowrite. You might've heard of Pseudowrite. Um, it's okay. It's probably not my favorite of the two, but there's a lot of things going for it. And there's, they've actually made some developments lately that I can't talk about yet that I'm really excited about that might end up being a, a, a big deal for them. Um, and then another one that I use quite frequently is called Novel Crafter, which is another one built specifically for model or for authors. And it all those do is they take the models and incorporate them into their software and just sort of like make it easier for authors specifically to do what they do, to craft prompts that are that you know include the characters and your world building and all that. So you don't have to manually grab all of your world building and character info and put it into your prompt. It'll like facilitate it so you don't have to do that. Um, and there's all kinds of things you can you can do with it. Novel crafters are particularly um, complex and versatile program. It can do like anything you want it to, uh, but for that reason can also sometimes be a little overwhelming for some authors. And so that's that's one that I use quite frequently. Uh, there's also a newer one out now called Raptor Write, which is free. Uh, well, it's free for the tool, but it's not free to use the, the AI models because those cost money every time you generate it. Um, uh, that one comes from Elizabeth Ann West and the Future Fiction Academy people. They're, they're a great educational resource if you're interested in learning more about uh, using AI. And... Uh, yeah, those, those are the big ones. There aren't really any others um, that are specifically author related. Um, and they all have the pros and cons. And I go into each of them in depth on my YouTube channel. So if you want more of that, you can go check that out. Sorry, that was a big, long answer to your question. Um, but that's that's the general idea. <laughs> are you mostly using when you're crafting your, your chapters and scenes and those individual pieces that you're doing that prompting for, are you frequently using novel crafter or uh, pseudo write, or are you frequently going straight to just chat GPT or, or Claude and just doing mm -hmm. a sort of a conversation back and forth thing? Yeah. Um, it depends on what I'm doing. Uh, my general recommendation to people is have one tool that's specific to uh, uh the novel writing process. So a novel crafter as an example. Um, and then also have a chat bot, whether that's chat GPT or Claude or even Gemini, Gemini's Google's model. Um, that it, it isn't bad either. Um, and any one of those chat bots are good because they're even more versatile. They're not really meant for authors specifically, but sometimes we just need to ask a question um, or, or, have it do something that is not novel writing, you know, like producing ad copy or something, you know, uh, or writing a book description. So, so I find it useful to have access to at least one of those tools. And thankfully they all have a free version. So you can use that. Uh, they're usually pretty limited. So I generally recommend having a paid version of one of them. 
it, you know, if you're serious about using AI for, for your writing and in your writing process. Uh, for me personally, my favorites are I use Novel Crafter and then I use a the paid version of Claude because um, I just kind of like Claude. Uh, but I know people that use Gemini and like Gemini a lot. Uh, Gemini is typically better than some of the others at brainstorming. So the, for every person in their your own uh, personal journey, uh, your own personal needs, there's going to be a need to try out a number of things and see which ones you like best. What about when it comes to the editing stage? Do you have <laughs> a, a recommendation uh, there for what, what does your process look like when it comes to editing? You know, this is funny because I get a lot of people, like, especially from the, the people that are not very AI friendly, they'll be like, AI is fine for editing, but it shouldn't be used to write your novel. Um, and my answer to that is like, actually, it's kind of the other way around. Uh, it's much better at writing your novel than it is at editing. Uh, also, I don't know why it's okay to put editors out of business, but not the writers. Out, I don't know, but uh, it seems like a double standard to me. But in the past, at least up to this point, AI has not been very good at editing. Um, you'll see that your standard editing tools that everyone knows about, Pro Writing Aid, Grammarly, have incorporated AI features into them, but that's usually not the kind where it will, I, I, you know, I think what people honestly want is just a tool that will take their writing and just make it better uh, or automatically remove all of the spelling and grammar errors. I think that's what we all sort of secretly want, right? But AI is a text generator, not a text editor by its nature, right? That's just how it works, um, which means that sometimes if you have it edit your text, it can sometimes do a decent job, but it will also sometimes rewrite what you wrote um, and you don't want it to, the, to do that. And so sometimes you have to watch out for that. Uh, you also can only edit a small section at a, at a time, a couple hundred words uh, at, at the most, because if you put too much in there, it doesn't have the capability of writing it all out again. Uh, so if I asked it to edit like 3000 words or like four, maybe it could, maybe some models could maybe do 3000, but if you put like four or 5,000 words in there, asked it to edit the whole thing, chances are it would rewrite it. So it was only like a thousand words long. Um, so there are things like that you just have to watch out for. And that's why it's hasn't in the past been really good at editing. I kind of mentioned this already though. Um, some of the new, the newer models, GPT-01 in particular, does appear to be a little bit better at editing because it's a reasoning engine. It it uh, it thinks differently than the others, um, and so we. I don't have any processes yet, and when I do, they will be on my YouTube channel. Um, but we are kind of working with these models and trying to find like what's the best approach to get really good editing out of this, uh, because I've done things like uh, give it an, an example of my writing and then have it go through the AI writing and then rewrite it to sound more like me. And it does a really good job. And also just naturally in that process, it removes any uh, errors or, or spelling errors and stuff like that. Um, so there, there's stuff you can, there's stuff that's emerging, but right, right now I would say don't count on AI for your editing. And I think one other thing to mention here is what's called the context window or the context length, mm -hmm. right? Because different models, uh, again, <laughs> this coming from someone who hasn't really, I I don't really play with AI, um, but uh, my understanding is different models have different context lengths. So if you put 100,000 words into one model, it's only going to really retain information from maybe four or 5,000 words of that that you just put in so it's not going to remember if you you know if you put a whole whole thing in there it's not going to remember like what you wrote in chapter one of your book if you're giving it like right you know okay now now come up with something that plays off of what happened in chapter one and not really get it is that <laughs> you tell me yeah how, is that yeah how... that's that's correct and some of the early ai models could only hold maybe a thousand two thousand words in it uh in its context window uh, now, nowadays, pretty much all of the major models have pretty large context windows. Um, but even if they could like handle your whole book, for example, 
uh, Gemini 1.5 Pro is one of the models out there that could actually handle a lot. Like it's at that point, like you could put the entire Harry Potter series into it and it would be able to handle that. Uh, but we found that even when it supposedly is capable of handling a enormous context window like that, um, it usually doesn't like it doesn't have perfect recollection recollection of everything. Um, so if I were to put the entire Harry Potter series and then ask it for a chapter by chapter breakdown of uh, like a summary of every single chapter in every single book, it would not be able to do that because it just uh, it's sort of like, I don't, I don't know how to explain this. Like imagine you took the entire Harry Potter series and just kind of like smushed it into your brain. It all kind of becomes intermingled a little bit and, uh, and, and less orderly. It's like compressed. Uh, it, and... Yeah. And it's sort of like, it's sort of like comprehended all at once mm. rather than systematically. Um, so it would not be able to give me a summary of every single chapter. And and we found that to be true. That's why, you know, a lot of people use AI to create a, a story Bible, for example, um, where they'll summarize all of the events of their book and then all of their characters and stuff. And we found that if you try to do that for your entire book at once, even if it can handle your entire book, uh, it works better to just go chapter by chapter and have it uh, pull out all the details one chapter at a time rather than doing it for your whole book at once. I think that understanding the context window and really just how much the AI can retain when you're feeding your prompts and you're going through all this stuff is an important thing to keep in mind there. Since we're also talking about the editing process, I did want to mention uh, someone said, my editor advised me to change the POV of a character in a story after I had written four chapters. It took me a week to do the first two chapters, partly because it was such boring work, right? Just going through sentence by sentence and change, making sure everything's from a, a particular POV and a, a different POV. And then uh, they said that they used ChatGPT and told it to change the POV and it did it did the next two chapters for them in about five minutes. So that's mm -hmm. another thing where uh, having AI to do that really mundane, a mundane task, like <laughs> every reference to this person that's in third person, now it needs to be in first person or whatever, um, seems like a, a good way to automate that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, in that particular instance, I would I would still advise you to read it through carefully and make sure. Absolutely. There's, uh, there's doubtless going to be some weirdness in places. Um, but yeah, like that's a really good example of something that uh, AI is really good at doing. Um, so, so, uh, substantial edits like that, uh, re, where it's like rewriting in different ways, uh, can be really helpful for sure. And uh, we also had a question since we're talking about in you. AI in the writing process, Amazon now asks or prompts authors when they're uploading a book to check a box that says, you know, was AI used? What are your, what's your threshold there for, you know, whether or not to check that box or how do you, how do you think about that? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So this is, this is a major concern from a lot of authors. They don't, uh, you know, they secretly want to use AI to help them out because it's such a useful tool, but they're like scared that Amazon will ban them or something like that. I get this all the time. Um, good news. Um, well, first of all, like my number one rule, don't write crap is in full effect uh, because Amazon doesn't, they're, they're not very happy about crappy books or scammy books. Uh, don't use AI to rewrite somebody else's book and try to pass it off on, uh, on your own. You know, all of those things that would be clearly unethical, don't do that because if Amazon finds out about it, yes, they will ban you. But it's not because of the use of AI. Um, Amazon is very pro AI. They're one of the biggest investors in Anthropic, which makes the Claude models. Um, I would not be surprised at all if in the near future uh, we were to get like AI integrated into Alexa uh, or, or something like that, or into an actual like, uh, book writing tool. Like if, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw AI integrated into KDP in some way in the future. Uh, I think they're 
they're not well i don't know what they're doing but um i can't speak to what amazon wants to do but i will say the that's space so they do ask you if you used ai in uh the generation of your book uh, and they make a distinction between ai assisted and ai uh, generated so if you used ai just for assistance which means you used it for brainstorming outlining editing any of those things uh, then you don't have to declare anything in that space. You can just say, nope, and move on. If you used it in the generation of the actual text, so this is, um, even if you only used it for a couple of paragraphs uh, or a chapter or something like that, and you generated the text, even if you edited it heavily afterward, uh, you do have to declare that. And they ask you for what tools that they use. What they say, and I believe them on this, is that they are gathering information. And I think specifically they're gathering information about the tools that authors are actually using. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they're on the hunt for acquisitions or something like that um, to, to see which, which of these tools are being actually used practically by authors. Uh, and then you just select like, um, they give you options like, did you use AI to write the whole book? with uh, minimal edits or with extensive edits or just a part of the book with whole edits or um, or with no edits or extensive edits. They give you options. Same with art. Uh, do you use art with a lot of editing or without a lot of editing? You know, but they do not punish you for that. You could be completely honest and they're fine. Uh, don't lie. <laughs> like if you do lie and they find out, then you might get in trouble. But um, even if you wrote a book with entirely with AI and did no editing on it uh, or little to no editing and you uploaded that, they would not uh, cancel your account or anything like that. Amazon is pro AI. Got it. And I think it's also important to understand when it comes to using AI in works, how does that work with copyright laws? Yeah. Saw a question about this in the chat too. So copyright is one of those interesting things. Now, I think um, let's just put a disclaimer that neither you nor I are a lawyer uh, and please do seek professional uh, advice if uh, if you want a more definitive answer. But I think I can cop comment on this. Um, in the United States specifically, uh, AI generated text or images is treated in the same way, essentially, as public domain material. Uh, meaning that in its pure form, like just, just now generated out of your AI machine of choice, it is not copyrightable because according to them, a human did not write it. I, di I disagree on a number of those points, and I'll get to that in a second. But um, uh, that's the case. You, you can't copyright the pure AI stuff that is generated um so it is essentially public domain open source how or creative commons whatever whatever you want to label it um however if you make any kind of edits on it uh to you know to make it your own to do whatever uh if you modify it in any way um, and if you're working with images, if you like, say you're using AI for a comic book and you're arranging the images in certain ways, and you might edit those images to, you know, maybe they've got a few, two extra fingers, uh, or a third arm or something like that. And you're uh, going into Photoshop and editing those things out and touching it up and do, you know, whatever it is, all of that, the edits that you make, the arrangement of the images and stuff is copyrightable inside of the U S so when you go to upload your book and ask for copyright, there is a space, uh, and and I don't have the exact language on me right now, but you can basically say this contains AI-generated material, and you're not looking for copyright of that uh, of that AI-generated material, but you um, are looking for copyright on your own edits of the material, your own placement and uh, assembly, essentially, of the product. And you can still get copyright for a book that was written even largely with AI. Uh, and you don't even have to say like 20% of this book was AI written or 80% of this book was AI written. Uh, because first of all, you're not going to know, like that's impossible to tell. 
Um, especially if you go through and you're editing it, you're adding sentences, words, paragraphs, taking stuff away. Like it's impossible to tell how much of it is AI and how much of it is you. Uh, and what, you know, if you do the process correctly, they will give you a copyright of your book and won't even like say that it's AI or anything. Like you can just have a copyright for that book. Um, in other countries outside the U S things are a little different, uh, not with all of them, but, uh, the UK and Japan and New Zealand and China all grant copyright for AI written material or AI generated material, images, text, et cetera. Uh, China and New Zealand are relatively recent on that. And I do think that the US is going to follow suit soon. There's actually a, uh, a lawsuit currently happening where someone who created a, a piece of art with AI and was denied copyright of it uh, is, is suing them, uh, basically saying that, you know, showing the creative process, because it's still a creative process of uh, how he prompted the thing, how he combined a whole bunch of images into this one image that he put together. And um, so that's going on. Uh, and the reason I think that this is going to change in the U in the U.S. comes down to if we look at another example with photography. Anybody know what it takes to own the copyright of an image taken with a camera? That's all it takes. If you push the button, you own the copyright to that image, which funny enough, if you're in Paris and you know, you're there with your significant other and you ask somebody to take a picture of you with the Eiffel Tower in the background, guess who owns the copyright to that picture? It's not you. Uh, it's the person that took the picture, even disregarding the fact that you own the camera. Um, now, most of the time that won't be an issue uh, because the stranger on the street that you had is not going to contest your copyright if you try to get a copyright of that. Um, but technically that is the law in most countries. Um, and so that that's just something. And I think if all it takes to be considered in sufficient human input into the creative process of photography, if all it takes is a single push of your finger, now I'm not saying that your image is necessarily art because it might not be, but you still own the copyright. If that's all it takes, then I feel like the process of putting a prompt into a AI generator, whether that's art or text, is even more human input than that. And therefore, the output that AI gives you based on the prompt that you gave it should, in my opinion, uh, be enough to qualify for copyright. And I think that's that's the argument that that's the reason that the UK did it. I could go into a, a bunch of like uh, court cases and stuff that the UK had that kind of led them to that conclusion. And I think that's why other countries have come on board. And especially now that China is doing that, uh, I think there's going to be competitive pressure on the US to to do a similar ruling. So that that's just my uh, my personal opinion there. But I think that's where we're going. Regardless, though, it sounds like, you know, for everything that you are generating, you are also doing a pretty heavy edit on all of it as well. So at the yeah. end of the day, you know, even if you theoretically in the future might have the copyright on whatever you produce using an AI, it shouldn't matter too much because you ought to be doing a pretty heavy edit on whatever you get out of it to make sure that you're not it's you, you you're not just publishing uh you know very poorly <laughs> poorly written works and stuff like that anyway mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. um that that ought to just be a, a consideration as well as you know with where copyrights law stands today at least in the US you 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 would need to make a bunch of edits and stuff to sort of make that copyrightable and you ought to be doing that anyway uh, just yeah. because if, you want to make if you do things book. the way I yeah if you do things the way I teach it you won't have any issue with it I also think it's funny you bring up the thing about the you know with a camera all you need to do is click a button there was actually a very interesting court case I remember reading about where a like a wildlife photographer left their camera standing in the woods or whatever 
and let the monkeys take the pictures. And then there was like a, there was a, there was a case about whether or not he owned the copyright because he wasn't the one that took the pictures is the monkeys took pictures. <laughs> of that is I a, can't yeah. That is actually the exact case that yeah. I was that I was thinking of um, yeah, yeah, because yeah. that it was handled differently in the U S versus the UK. The U S mm. did not allow him to have copyright because he didn't take the picture. Uh, right. But the UK did. Uh, normally, it would be the you know, uh, we don't grant copyright to animals, uh, and both the US and the UK agreed on that. We don't grant a copyright to the to the chimp uh, or the monkey, and um, but but then the question became: Well, then should the the photographer who owned the camera should he have the rights to the image? The US said no. So that in the US, that image is essentially public domain. And the UK said yes, because their ruling was that uh, whoever the most logical person is that should own it would own it in the, in that situation. And that's one of the reasons why the UK immediately from, from the get-go pretty much allows AI text uh, and images to be copyrighted because we don't grant copyright to robots, but we do grant copyright to people. And so they just said, well, or whoever is the most logical next person up right in, in the owning of that copyright they should get it uh which in in most cases would be the person who prompted the ai uh and but the the us is still like dragging their feet on that issue because of that particular case so so we talked about ai for outlines brainstorming ai for writing AI for editing. The next part, now you've got your book, you've edited it, you've done all of that stuff. Next part is promoting the book. What are some ways that you might incorporate AI into sort of the marketing aspects of the book? I, I mentioned briefly before things like helping you write the description or the blurb for the book might be a place where some authors are including AI. Are there other places where AI comes into that as well? Yeah, uh, the book description is probably the big one because I know a lot of authors hate copywriting because <laughs> uh, it's a totally different writing skill from writing your book, right? Um, and so doing that can be a, a huge help. Um, and, and there are varying degrees of of quality that you can get with that. If you just ask it to like, hey, write a book description about XYZ book, uh, it might not do a good job. But if you say like, here's a template of like all the things that I want this book description to cover. And then here's a full description of my book. Then you can usually get better results out of it. Uh, or better yet, you can even have it analyze other book descriptions out there, like give it examples from your genre and then have it come up with a template from that and then write uh, your book description. Lots of cool stuff you could do there. Um, ad copy is another one you can do if you run Facebook or, or Amazon ads can be a good one. It's not particularly amazing at ad copy, but it can get you unstuck. And if you have some good copywriting templates to give it, uh, AI always works better if you give it examples and templates. Um, because if you just say, hey, write me 10 best-selling uh, headlines, um, it's gonna give you mediocre results. If you say, hey, write 10 best-selling headlines with these uh, formats, like uh, templates, it'll, it'll do a better job. So that's another one. Um, Email, uh, it, it can help with email. I wouldn't have it write your entire email all by itself, but um, usually it can give you uh, a lot of, I know a lot of people don't really care for email uh, and having to write email frequently. And yet it's the best marketing source that you have as an author. And so it should be utilized. So, uh, you know, for, for instance, for me, I will sometimes take the transcript of a video that I made. I'll run it through AI and have it turn it into a newsletter. Then I'll just touch that up to make sure it it's, makes sense, and then um, and then I'll make a newsletter out of that and point people to the video if they want to know more. Uh, stuff like that can uh, can be very useful. Um, I know a lot of people are probably going to be curious about this, but something we're seeing a, a huge rise in these days is AI generated video and video ads and things like that. AI is getting really good at that. I can't speak to how you create those things as much because I haven't done a whole lot of experimenting with it. That's a whole new 
realm of stuff to to dive into um but you can essentially create you know what compared to just even a year ago uh pretty high quality videos using ai video or just even ai images uh that you do like a slideshow or something like that and you can get ai generated audio um to to go with it um for instance, you could take a snippet of your book and have the AI audio read it. And then you create like a slideshow or or some AI video to go along with that audio and then put that on TikTok and, uh, you know, create a bunch of those. Uh, I understand authors are are doing really well with that kind of stuff and that they, they are succeeding. Uh, I know of one YouTube channel that does it. Um, creates like little short stories and stuff. And they're already at like 350,000 subscribers um, because of that content. And that's all, all it is. It's a faceless YouTube channel, which I'm not like, I'm sort of like somewhat morally against faceless YouTube channels, but uh, that's just a personal preference. Um, cause, Cause I think human connection is going to be even more important in the age of AI. But, um, uh, but yeah, so that, that's something we're seeing a lot of. I haven't delved into it too much yet, but I think uh, using AI in video for video marketing of your books is going to be a, a big deal in the next year or two. So I think we covered pretty much like all <laughs> the entire process from outlining to the marketing aspects. I was wondering if we could do a quick screen share of where they should go to start and what like how just it works from a mechanical point of view. Do you want me to do like one of the tools I mentioned, like Novel Crafter? It's a little bit complex, but you can, you don't have to do everything in it. You can just get started. You said Novel Crafter is a little bit more of a complex tool and it does a whole bunch of stuff. So maybe starting there would All be right. too much, but maybe just okay. like a quick example of Let's... like how you might interact with Claude or something along those lines. Yeah, um, I'll pull up my Claude account here. Um... Okay, can everyone see it all right? Yep. All right, so this is my Claude Pro account. Um, I mentioned there are multiple models here, some of them. So uh, each model does behave a little bit differently. Uh, but the most advanced one, the one I use the most is this one, Claude 3.5 Sonnet. And um, you can just, uh, I mean, you, possibilities are literally endless. So you can just go in and just say, give me 20 ideas for uh, let's say a mystery novel, we'll say a cozy cat mystery novel, um, with, uh, and then you can give it, you know, if you have anything else that you already have an idea about, you can just throw it in there, like with, um, a, I don't know, I've never read anything in this genre, so a, with a dog rivalry, I don't know. Uh, and then just hit go. And it gives you a bunch of ideas. And again, some of these might not be great ideas, but they can get the the de the, the mind rolling. Um, so a bookstore cat solves mysteries and best-selling novels, outshining the story. Zoom in just mystery. a bit. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um a valuable dog painting goes missing and a cat detective must solve the case while battling canine prejudice. <laughs> That actually makes me laugh. Um, so there's lots of stuff you can do there. If, if I took this, I could then say, uh, or I can just continue in the chat and say, expand option one uh, to a whole novel, we'll say novella outline following the hero's journey. I'm doing, and this is kind of simple. Like the examples I'm giving you, there's like way more complicated ways to do that, but it pulls up this uh, option here and it gives me act one, call to adventure, refusal to call, and it gives me a full outline here. Now, I always say at every stage in this process, make sure you go through it and make sure it's yours and you, you know, it fits with your story. Typically, if I were writing this myself, I probably would already have a lot of ideas and would include those in the prompt. So it makes sure to, it, it, it incorporates it and so forth. And then you can just kind of keep going down the, the list. So um, so from here, I would say, write the first 1,000 words of this story. 
based on the outline. Uh, do it. Well, I don't have time to like put in a full style prompt, but a lot of people will put information about what style they want to put in here. Um, we don't have time for that, but I'm just going to let it go. Could you just explain what you mean by put in a style prompt? Yeah, so a style prompt uh, is just a shorthand for, you can give it information about the style. Um, so an obvious example of this would be like, what point of view is it in? Um, I didn't put even that in, or, or is it past tense or present tense and stuff like that. And you can give it additional information um, like, do you want it to be kind of dark and gloomy? Do you want it to be more like happy-go-lucky? Um, all of that. Uh, and then here we get Whiskers McTabby. <laughs> uh, stretched languidly across the sun warm windowsill of the Pawsville Art Gallery. Sleek tabby fur gleaming in the late afternoon light. Yada, yada, yada. So a lot of this would need editing. As a retired show cat, Whiskers appreciated the finer things in life and art was certainly one of them. He'd been living in the gallery ever since his human Amelia Foster had adopted him three years ago. It was a cushy gig for a cat pushing nine years old. Plenty of su sunny spots for naps. The occasional dropped morsel from gallery patrons. Best of all, no di dogs allowed. Well, almost no dogs. So uh, parts of this, I'm like, yeah, I, I like that. I think that's good. Uh, other parts would need editing. Uh, and if I had gone through the process and given it a lot more information about my vision for the story, it would probably need even less editing. Um, but uh, I guess we're we're a little over. Is that all right if I just show you a, a quick demo of how I do book descriptions? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Let's go to Amazon real fast. Someone give me a genre. Lit RPG. Lit RPG. <laughs> yeah. Lit RPG. <laughs> Um, these are all sponsored. Okay, so let's find some that we know are like good books that have a lot of reviews. We'll just take these uh, these here. He, um, so we have a, a book here. He was a hero, now he's not. He'll stop at nothing to rise to the top again. Max with murder, yada, yada, yada. Okay, so this is a good. So what I'm doing here is I'm grabbing an example. And you can do this with multiple or you can do it with one. And I say, analyze the following book description on a sentence by sentence basis um analyzing what it is doing from a copywriting what uh copy writing perspective and then i just paste in the the um the book description and put it in there and here it gives me like an analysis. So we have the, the first line, he was a hero, now he's not. He'll stop at nothing to rise to the top again. These short, punchy sentences create immediate intrigue and contrast between past and present status, sets up the core conflict, et cetera. And while this is going, just because I don't want to have to come up with this on the spot because we're short on time, I'm going to say, give me an idea for a lit RPG book. All right, so it just gave me an idea um, just because I don't have time to think of one right now. Um, let's go back to this analysis or we're back at the analysis of that one. Say, now using that analysis as a template, write a book description for this book idea. Then I paste in the idea. He was the only one awake. Now he's not alone. He'll risk everything to save a world that forgot it was dreaming. Jake opened his eyes to find himself unplugged. The vast MMORPG that encompassed all of humanity had spit him out, leaving him stranded in a world everyone else had long abandoned, the real world. But Earth isn't empty as empty as it should be. And you'll notice it's following kind of a similar structure while not plagiarizing this initial thing. It's still talking about this idea, my idea, or, 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 you know, whatever your idea is, but it's doing so based on a model that you gave it. And, um, I like this because every genre has different conventions for what makes a good book description. Sometimes you like a, a nonfiction genre, for instance, will be very different from fiction. Some book descriptions use, uh, uh, first person, like it's like the character talking in their voice. So you'll see different things like that. And so sometimes it's helpful to find uh, in this case, I only did one, but you can also take two or three or more and have it analyze all of them and then sort of combine them into one template that can be a little bit 
better if you're worried about plagiarism or anything getting too close to the original. Um, and this ends up giving you much better results for your book description than if you just said, give me a book description for this book. So got it. Um, so this is an example of why like uh, your, your prompting matters, right? Uh, which prompt you have can create something that's drastically different. I get a lot of people saying like, I tried AI and it was crap. And I'm like, well, have you have you to try prompting? in a bunch of different ways. Yeah, yeah. You, you can't just you can't just take the first thing that you get because it it matters a lot what you put in. <laughs> yeah, is going to significantly change the output. Um, and someone someone asked, what do you type in for full length novel to get your book description? Uh, do you give it your I... own synopsis and then tell it? To... Yeah reword it using like a you know the style from another book description kind of thing i would basically just write down my own little summary of it or even try to write my own book description and just do my best um because it doesn't need to know the whole plot of your book uh in fact it might make it worse if you tried um for you know for instance a book description shouldn't reveal the ending of your book but if you put in the whole book and asked it to write a book description, maybe it would. Uh, there's too much information. All it needs to know is like, what's the hook? What's the world? Who are the main characters? What's the central conflict? I certainly appreciate you uh, giving us a little bit more insight into what your process has been like. For anyone that has any follow-up questions or wants more resources, where can they go to check out the stuff that you've put out there? So just type it in the chat here. Here's my YouTube channel. I also have a free course that I offer people. All you have to do is sign up for my email list. I have a bunch of free resources and things that you can get uh, by signing up for the email list. And then of course I put a lot of like most of the stuff that I talk about uh, related to the AI is all free on my YouTube channel. Um, I talk about it pretty in depth there. So people can go to nerdynovelist.com and they would also find the links to your YouTube channel and all of that stuff there as well, right? Yes. Cool. All right. So nerdynovelist.com. And then if they want to sign up for your mailing list and get some of those other things for them, it's ner nerdynovelist.com slash free. Um, and you're the nerdy novelist on your YouTube channel. Uh, mm -hmm. And any anywhere like on social media or anything that people ought to follow you besides YouTube or? My handle is Story Hobbit pretty much everywhere. I'm not on social media very much. YouTube and my email list are definitely the best ways to find me. If anyone has any uh, additional follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to me as well. Evan at storyoriginapp.com. You can send questions my way and and I might just uh, uh, <laughs> I might just forward some of those to Jason <laughs> and Happy say, hey, here's one for you. Um, uh, but thanks so much again to everyone that came and hung out with us today. Thank you again, Jason, for coming and chatting with us. And I'm look looking forward to seeing you all in the next one.